My name is Jeff Sharp, the Director of the School of Environment and Natural Resources, and we're delighted to host you this morning. Um, we appreciate such a wonderful turnout. This is one of our largest EPNs. We've kind of packed you in here, and I know we've actually overtaxed the coffee a bit today, so bear with us. We haven't managed this size of crowd um, uh, in the past, but it's wonderful to see such a, a large number of people turning out to, uh, to um, share their love for rivers. Uh, we have a very exciting program this morning for the love of rivers, celebrating 50 years of the Scenic River Act. We have two fantastic speakers who will take, on a, take us on a journey uh, alongside an iconic American legislative landmark and how this effort is implemented at the state level and on the local level in Southwest Ohio. Be start, before we start the program today, I want to welcome the newcomers to the EPN. Uh, and as a reminder, the only way to receive notices of the monthly breakfast programs is to sign up as an EPN participant. It is free, quick, and easy by going to epn.osu.edu. I know many of you are very interested in rivers and water topics, and we have a wonderful slate of those kind of topics throughout the year. So if you're new to us today, please take the time to sign up and become aware of sort of like the future things. And obviously, our message is getting out there through other networks as well. So uh, we welcome you. I'm told today that we have a large number of students registered for the program. If you're a current Ohio State student, please raise your hand. Wonderful. One of the th reasons we do the Environmental Professionals Network is to create opportunities for you to interact with the next generation of professionals. So there are many among you that are working in the field, have experiences with NGOs, with uh, uh, private sector, with government agencies. Please take some time and sort of uh, introduce yourself to some of the students here. We know that they really appreciate it. We've gotten to the point where some of the, our students are actually graduating and returning to us as EPN participants, and we love the sort of like uh, community that we've created here. So please take the time to sort of reach out and say hello to them after the program if you get a chance. Last month, in collaboration with the Ohio State's Facilities Operation and Development Department, we worked toward making our EPN breakfast officially a zero-waste event. In keeping with today's theme for love of the environment, it is our aim to divert at least 90% of this breakfast program's material waste for, from landfill through composting and recycling. Please, please help us accomplish this goal um, by paying close attention to the signs that are above the uh, uh, waste receptacles to determine if, which um, slot your item belongs in. Uh, it either goes into compost, recycling, or trash. Thank you for participating in our zero-sum waste efforts. In 1960, 1968 was an iconic year in the environmental movement. UNESCO organized its first biosphere conference in Paris to discuss global environmental problems, including pollution, resource loss, and wetlands destruction. Stanford University professor Paul Ehrlich published The Population Bomb, describing the ecological threats of a rapidly growing human population. As it relates to today's topics, Congress passed the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act in 1968 to preserve select rivers across the nation to keep them in free-flowing condition and to protect their immediate environments, remarkable scenic and recreational values, fisheries and wildlife, and historical and cultural assets for the benefit and enjoyment of present and future generations. A lot of things happened 50 years ago. Meanwhile, in July of that year, I have to have plug, plug in here, the School of Environment and Natural Resources was created at Ohio State University um, under the administrative unit of the College of Agriculture and Home Economics. The purpose of this new school was to bring together various groups transmitting knowledge through resident instruction, extension, and public service programs, and generating knowledge through its research on natural resources. We're delighted to sort of be uh, uh, standing here 50 years later and uh, uh, um, celebrating in our own way. In the following year, a lot of things happened around this time. 1969, a major oil spill off the coast of Santa Barbara, California, and Ohio's own Cuyahoga River catching on fire would drive increased public awareness towards significant environmental action. In 1970, the first Earth Day was celebrated, and landmark environmental legislation would soon be passed, creating much of the broader regulatory frameworks that guide us five decades later. We'll have a lot of 50th anniversary topics to be celebrating the next uh, couple of years. But a lot of things happened then, and I'm excited that we can, we can continue to gather and celebrate these landmark achievements. So let's take, turn today, today to our landmark 50th anniversary celebration of the Scenic Rivers Act. We are honored to host two statewide leaders in preserving and promoting our river assets. First to speak today is Bob Gable, the Scenic Rivers Program Manager for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Bob has been with the ODNR for over 25 years, working in Scenic Rivers programs throughout his entire career. He's held numerous posts for Scenic Rivers, including program and educational coordinator positions across Central and Southwest Ohio, before taking his current statewide position. Prior to coming to the ODNR, Bob worked at Columbus Zoo and Aquarium and the Battelle Memorial Institute. He is a graduate of the Ohio State University with a degree in zoology. Our second speaker is Hope Taft, who will speak about her efforts to join neighbors to form the Little Miami River Cleaners and the Little Miami Watershed Network to help preserve and protect the Little Miami River near her home in Dayton, Ohio. I will give a more complete introduction to Hope after Bob's presentation. So let's give a warm Buckeye welcome to Bob Gates. 
Baku. Oh, sorry. Oh. oh, that's never happened. I meant to say Bob Gay, but we have a faculty in this school called Bob Gay, so welcome, Bob. Maybe they give me some of the Gates family money, huh? <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's great to be here today. Um, see all these people that uh, a lot of old friends from past Scenic River efforts and Natural Areas Division of Natural Areas and Preserves and other people that have worked with us and partners that have worked with us in the conservation of scenic rivers um, throughout the years. So thanks for coming out today. Really appreciate it. It's good to see everybody. Uh, hope you enjoyed the presentation. I want to point out before I get going here, we have a we actually have our own logo now. So that was created just for the uh, 50th anniversary. So I been saying that, you know, you hit the big time when you got your own logo. So we're on our way up. So anyways, let's see if I can get going here. Work the, okay. So the first question, why do we exist? The mission of the Scenic Rivers Program is to identify and protect some of the highest quality streams that remain in the state of Ohio. It's not about aesthetics as the name implies. It's more about conservation of uh, high quality stream resources, uh, things that have um, high biodiversity, good water quality, and basically intact, complete, functioning stream ecosystems. So we try to identify these streams and work with local partners to protect them for future generations. So the uh, state, state Scenic Rivers Law is provided for in the Ohio Revised Code. And as we've already heard, it was the first uh, Scenic Rivers program passed in the nation, first state legislation. February 28th, 1968, so we're approaching our birthday. Um, it actually predated the National Wild and Scenic Recreational Rivers Act, which was passed in the same year, October of the same year, and also predated the Clean Water Act, which was passed in 1972. So the individuals that worked on this legislation and passed it were really thinking very progressively about the conservation of, of high quality stream resources. Some of the individuals that uh, were responsible for that legislation, I don't know, some of the uh, the older members in the crowd might recognize some of these names, but um, I know uh, Paul Gilmore held many uh, posts in uh, state and U.S. Uh, legislation. I believe he was a congressman. Um, Corn M. Nixon, there was a, there's a covered bridge named for him over the Little Miami River, you know, just south of Waynesville. And of course, uh, Governor Voinovich, who was a state representative at the time. The Speaker of the House was Charles Kerfus who um, is, is with us today and is going to be joining us for some Scenic River celebrations later on this year. So it'll be good to, I've never met him, it'll be good to meet him. And the legislation was signed by Governor Rhodes in, in March of 1968. And contrary to uh, popular opinion or what you may have heard, I have not been with the program the entire 50 years. Um, <laughs> Just over 25, 25 and a half actually. So I've been there long. I've been there for more than half of the duration of the program. But uh, this is me as a young scenic river manager down on the Little Miami River, uh, circa 1994. Just getting started there. And today we have 14 streams designated as state wild scenic recreational rivers across the state that captures 800, 800 stream miles. Just over 800. I think it's actually 801. Three different designations, wild, scenic, and recreational. From a legal perspective, there's no difference. They are, they're offered the same level of protection. These different designations just identify the degree of natural character that these rivers possess. And there is uh, protection provided for these rivers under the Ohio Revised Code, Section 1547.82, which I will touch on a little bit later. And private property rights are also protected in this legislation. Um, in a different section, 1547.81. And that section basically says that designation of a river as a wild scenic or recreational river doesn't give the director of ODNR, any other governmental agency, or any political subdivision in the state the ability to restrict the use of private property. So it's, it's spelled out in the legislation. That's something that's been a problem for us over the years because when we come into an area to potentially designate a stream, um, local landowners say, well, that's going to, affect my private property rights and I'm not going to be able to do what I want and, and that's something we oftentimes have to overcome but um, that's not true so and here's a map showing the um, current distribution of the designated rivers in the state while we're here I want to take a real quick moment to introduce staff 
so you can you can relate them to the where they're at on the map. So we'll start in Northeast Ohio. Matthew Smith, he's our Northeast Ohio Senior Group Manager. Central Ohio, Heather Doherty. And we have Christine Zymanski, who is our Stream Quality Monitoring Coordinator in Central Ohio. And Kayla Luft is a college intern working with us in Central Ohio. Northwest Ohio, we have Christina Cookley. And Southwest Ohio, we have uh, Melissa Clark. So these, these people are responsible for the implementation of the Scenic Rivers Program for ODNR at the local level, that regional level. And they work on the, the rivers that are identified in their region. So as I mentioned, there's three different levels of designation. Wild, there are three, three rivers in the system designated as wild rivers, Little Beaver Creek, the Grand River, and, and sections, of, uh, sections of the Grand River, and Conneaut, sections of Conneaut Creek. The wild designation, as you can probably imagine or guess, um, these, are the, these are the most remote, um, least developed, least disturbed stream corridors. So, you know, very rural, undeveloped areas, um, deep wooded corridors, not much in the way of development in these areas at all. This is, uh, you can see here, Little Beaver Creek, the valley. Uh, the forest extends all the way up the valley wall. There's sections of Little Beaver Creek, if you're paddling down it, you can, you know, you won't even see uh, any signs of human uh, existence, no houses or anything. So these are, these are the most natural and highest degree of natural character of all the rivers. Most of the rivers in the system fall in the scenic category, and again, um, these are in rural areas. They may not be as remote as, as the wild rivers. Many of them flow through agricultural uh, watersheds uh, where the, that agricultural land use has helped protect natural integrity of these streams. They have good riparian corridors, good water quality, high biological diversity. Uh, this is the Little Miami near Clifton. Um, the closest scenic rivers here in central Ohio are Big Little Derby Creek, Old Tangy River, Kokosing. So you folks uh, may have uh, heard of those or paddled those. And then we also have the recreational designation, which really doesn't imply that the river is for heavy recreational use, but this is a category that captures those couple of segments of streams that they may not meet the criteria for, fully meet the criteria for a scenic river, but they do possess natural and, and other attributes that make them worthy of designation and protection. This is the Maumee River. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the, uh, the big walleye run that occurs up there in the spring. And in this corridor is actually some historical elements that, that contributed to the designation of the Maumee. So what does it take to become a scenic river? This is not uh, uh, just an, an exercise by ODNR where we identify something and go out and designate it. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this. That's, that's why in 50 years we've only got 14 designated. Um, it, it takes a lot of work and, and the work must start at the local level. It, it needs to be driven by local conservation organizations, interested landowners, the local community, community leaders. They need to get together and say, hey, we have a nice river here. Let's see if we can get it designated as scenic river. And then they need to begin building the support at the local level. And we actually ask for resolutions and letters of support from townships, counties, municipalities, and other political subdivisions. And once we have those in hand, we feel that that is a, a sufficient level of display of support, then we can commence with a designation study. And we have actual criteria that the rivers must meet um, to be included in the scenic river system and different criteria for the different levels of designation. So this, these criteria relate to things like depth of riparian forest and uh, human intrusions in the river corridor. I'll touch on that here in just a minute as well. So once the designation study is complete and all these different, the different criteria are addressed and evaluated, land use, biological community, all this information goes into the designation study. Um, it's submitted to the director of the Department of Natural Resources and if he, he agrees that it's worthy of designation and, is, and there's a sufficient level of support, then he can issue his intent to designate and after that there's a 30 day public comment period that during which we'll have some local outreach sessions and in, in the local community just to make sure that everybody is comfortable with it. And assuming everything goes uh, just as planned or as diagrammed, then the director can designate the river with a journal entry. So I mentioned uh, what does it take to be a scenic river, some of the, the natural criteria, obviously outstanding water quality. We're not looking at uh, streams that have pollution issues or other, other types of uh, you know, water contamination issues. 
and a contiguous riparian forest buffer. This is, this is very important in the, the overall equation. The, the forest buffer adjacent to a stream or the natural buffer, in some cases it may be a wetland or some other type of habitat, typically it's forest though. This, this uh, forest buffer is as much a part of the stream system as the channel and the water and the substrate of the stream. It's all interrelated. You gotta have this riparian forest buffer um, to have a fully functional, high quality stream ecosystem. So it's very important to us. Um, number of human intrusions. We actually look at the number of bridge crossings, miles of road in the stream corridor, um, industrial facilities if there's any, number of dwellings, all these kinds of these different parameters and criteria are looked at and evaluated before we determine if the river meets one of their criteria and it's uh, eligible for designation. And finally, I've been talking about high biological diversity. If this is probably the most important thing we're looking at. We want to see a stream system that is a complete, intact, functional stream system ecology. And what that means is from the very basic level, macroinvertebrates, aquatic macroinvertebrates at the base of the food chain, all the way up through, you have the complete assemblage of fish, birds, mammals, all the other uh, components of the ecosystem are intact and fully functional. So if you have a, a polluted or degraded system, um, the first thing that happens is you begin to lose species and the natural native species begin to fall, off the, uh, fall out of the system and they're typically replaced with more um, invasive or um, tolerant species. And I have the, the, the um, club shell mussel up there. I always say uh, extra, uh, extra credit points are given for endangered species. So if we have some of those, in the river system that, that makes it a little higher priority as well. So what do we do to uh, protect these streams once they are designated? Well, the highest priority for us is the riparian forest conservation. And I talked about that just briefly. Um, again, the forest buffer is an important component of the stream system. Uh, the trees filter pollutants from runoff, both surface runoff and the root system will, will soak up excess nutrients and things and, and keep it out of the stream. Uh, the trees shade the stream, which keeps the water temperature cool and constant. If you don't have a riparian forest buffer, you'll get these big fluctuations in, in water temperature, heat up during the day, cool down at night. Uh, you also have excess sunlight that can promote excess algal growth. They also function to help keep the stream channel and the bank stable. You know, if you look at a tree, you can basically say that there's as much mass to a tree below the ground as there is above the ground. So if, you're, if that tree's on a stream bank, all that root mass is holding that stream bank in place and helping keep that channel stable and, and reduce excessive bank erosion. Also provides stream habitat, uh, the woody debris that comes off the, the trees, the trees themselves that fall in the river, limbs. Um, this material gets settled into the stream channel and provides habitat for, for fish and aqua other aquatic animals. And the leaf litter is the base of the food chain in the stream system. If you see here, this uh, small stream, um, there's really, there's not much sunlight that comes in through the canopy. You can see the leaves on the surface of the water. That leaf litter ultimately sinks to the bottom of the stream and feeds the macroinvertebrate community, which in turn feeds the fish community and on up through the food chain. So this, this leaf litter in these, in these small streams is the, the energy source for the whole system. And also provide uh, travel corridors for terrestrial wildlife. In some scenic rivers, we see very good populations and high diversity of, of different types of breeding riparian birds as well. So the uh, riparian uh, corridor does benefit uh, terrestrial ecosystems as well. Our efforts to conserve riparian corridor, we own just over 2,300 acres. Uh, fee simple, that means we own it, DNR owns it. We have over 3,600 acres of conservation easement. Now these are conservation easements, these are areas that are protected by a legal document. It's, it, the landowner has given up their rights to develop the property, and we essentially hold those rights. So it is, those properties are maintained in a natural forested condition, and that's all voluntary. Uh, landowners will approach us and, and offer to do that. We're not out beating the bushes, so to speak, trying to get that done. And most of these uh, sites that we own were acquired with uh, grant money. Um, we've been very good at getting grants over the years, and we were, uh, when we were really actively buying land, at one point we had generated like $12 million in grants in a 10-year period. So about $1.2 million a year is not bad. Um, some of that came directly to us, to Scenic Rivers, to acquire properties. And some of that we helped partners get. 
and we will do that um, quite a bit. Even today, we're doing that. Help partners write grants or help them uh, take other take care of other processes that make them eligible for grants. For example, in Central Central Ohio, we just uh, Heather Doherty rewrote a section of the Cocosing Watershed Plan to try to help Mount Vernon get some funding for a bank stabilization project. Many of our sites are leased or managed in cooperation with local entities, local park districts and others. That really works out well because uh, we don't have a big staff to manage properties. Um, but most of them are overall managed for stream protection. And all of our sites are actually open. Um, I don't think many people realize that because in many cases we don't have access to these sites. We don't have a, a parking lot or a good way to get in. But, you know, you might have a 50-acre parcel of riparian forest along a stream. They're not closed to the public. You can go in there and fish and walk around and not get in trouble. Um, just in many cases, we haven't had the resources over the years to develop real good access. We've been actually working on that in recent years, and we're increasing uh, you know, access opportunities to many of these sites. We also have worked to increase uh, some hunting opportunities on these properties. We've done some uh, lottery-style uh, bow hunts, limited... Uh, limited number of individuals can get in through a drawing. And as, as I mentioned, we're working on uh, improving stream access to many of these sites. We also are, are kind of uh, developing this concept of these uh, paddle or float-in sites. We have some sites on scenic rivers that we own that, believe it or not, we don't have access to from roads. Um, so we have these parcels. They're tucked back in. We acquired them. We have one on Little Darby. It's 110 acres, beautiful site. We have no way to get to it, but what we're going to try to do is promote these as paddling sites where you and other paddlers can float into these sites. You can get out, you can fish, you can rest, hike around and enjoy these areas. So we're still going to, they're available to people to, to use and enjoy. You just got to figure out how to get to them. <laughs> and ultimately, as I mentioned before, we're uh, managing all these sites for stream protection. And we do some eco-management when we can. Um, some of these sites have our properties have remnant prairies and, and wetland ecosystems and things on them. Uh, oftentimes we'll have volunteer groups help us go in and try to remove invasive species to, to restore and improve these, these little habitat fragments. As I mentioned, we're uh, trying to increase hunting opportunities. Um, I have to admit, this, this deer didn't come from one of our sites, but, <laughs> but there is a little story behind it. Uh, actually, this gentleman, he called me earlier in the year and uh, he said, Bob, he said, how do I get into one of your lottery drawings to go bow hunting on your property? And I, I had to tell him, I said, well, sir, sorry, but you're too late. Um, we already did that, and, and you know, we're, we're full up. All the slots have been allotted. And uh, so, but I, we continued talking, and I went ahead and told him, you know, he was interested in hunts on the Derby. So I went ahead and told him about where he could go into uh, some Metro Parks property and hunt. And... Um, he did that, and he called me just a couple weeks ago, and he says, Bob, I want to thank you so much. I, I listened to what you said. I went into this, hunted this area, and I shot this nice mature buck. So it, we helped him out in the end anyways, where you know he couldn't come on our property. But uh, he's very happy, and um, that's, a, that's a nice deer. So We do also we do some uh, organized hunts on some of our properties. This is on the Sandusky River. This is something that's uh, been happening for several years now, since 2000. This is a Pheasants Forever youth hunt at our Kill Dog property on the Sandusky Scenic River. And uh, it's held there every year. And since 2000, over uh, 980 youth have participated in this event. So it's a really great event. Uh, members of the Pheasants Forever chapter and local volunteers bring dogs and function as guides and take the kids out and, um, you know, rouse the pheasants up and, and help them shoot them. This has also resulted in a management agreement between us Scenic Rivers and Pheasants Forever, and now we're working with them. They're helping uh, restore some of the, the floodplain area on this property. We have a lot of these properties. We, we acquire them, and they're in ag land use. We just let them go. And you can see here there's a lot of, looks like goldenrod in that picture. Uh, many cases we'll have these kind of monocultures of these, these weeds and things. You know, it's hard to get, believe it or not, hard to get trees and other natural vegetation started in these sites. So if we can... If we can get somebody to help us with restoration and, and um, ecological management on these sites, we can, we can do a lot. Increased access, I mentioned we've been working on that. 
last uh, three years we've refurbished or actually reopened. We actually reopened a couple sites, but we've worked on 13 and spent about $260,000 on those. And we're currently evaluating some other sites as well and to make some improvements yet this spring, particularly some sites in the Darby. This, this access here is on, um, you can see the uh, Maumee River. Uh, this was basically an earthen bank and people were, I don't know how, carrying their boats down it because it was kind of like a sheer earth wall. Not only that maybe you drop your boat down and then shimmy down the bank to get it, I don't know. But so this, is a, this was a great improvement to that site. Some other sites, um, down the Little Miami, this uh, articulated concrete mat at Fort Ancient. Site here on the Narrows. This, this site is really nice. This turned out really well. Melissa Clark worked with uh, some local contractors to get this done on the Narrows. This nice natural stone staircase down to the river with a little launch site in the river. Uh, little Beaver Creek, new access there. And then some improvements on a, a small access on Conneaut Creek as well. So uh, we try to keep these things as natural as possible using natural stone, native cut stone, other materials like that. We stay away, stay away from asphalt. You know, asphalt's not consistent with the scenic river. So um, the articulated concrete mat here, this is, that may look pretty intrusive and pretty beefy, big, you know, but actually that was asphalt. So we took the asphalt out there and put this more, uh, more permeable, porous material in. And this site is really heavily used, so you can't, you need something there to, to accommodate the traffic. This is probably one of the most, uh, probably one of the busiest access sites in the state uh, overall. And there's a need for this. Um, if you take a look at uh, hand-powered registrations, these are mostly canoes and kayaks, actually probably mostly kayaks in the recent years. This is uh, 2000, this is 10 years, 2007 through 2016. We don't have 2017 data here, but you can see how the registrations have grown, doubled basically. Uh, the other interesting thing though, is I had our folks in the registration and timing section pull out the registrations that are in counties that have scenic rivers in them. So that's the orange part, portion of the bar. Uh, as you, and you can see in each case, the orange section of the bar is bigger than the blue section of the bar, but only one third of the state, one third of the counties have scenic rivers in them. So there's actually this bit of a disproportion there um, between the number of uh, hand-powered craft being registered in scenic river counties versus other counties in the state. So that's it's kind of interesting. And I think that's just because people want to paddle on a nice waterway, obviously. So something that has uh, good water quality, nice riparian corridor, and uh, you know they can they can get in and splash around and, and enjoy themselves. So overall, just a quick review: um, you know, the protection of uh, these riparian areas. You know, the top two are our main priority, obviously, with the program: protect water quality, stream biological diversity, and the natural character of the corridor. But you get all these other ancillary benefits from that, places where people can recreate, good fisheries, excellent fisheries. Um, actually, a friend of mine sent, a, sent me a picture of a smallmouth bass last night that he just caught in the winter from Little Darby. It looked like it was almost four pounds. I wanted to put it in the presentation, but the presentation was already done. So, But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just a beautiful fish that he just caught. So um, phenomenal fisheries, um, increased hunting opportunities, and opportunities for in terrestrial wildlife communities, and ultimately green space for communities in urban areas. So as communities urbanize, urbanize and expand around the scenic river corridors, these scenic river corridors can provide uh, much needed green space. And we do a lot of education as well. And our main uh, educational program is stream quality monitoring, which is a volunteer macroinvertebrate mon monitoring program. Uh, it's very effective. Uh, we use it a lot to get uh, students out into the streams, teach them a little bit about stream ecology, how to monitor macroinvertebrates. Basically, you use a kick seine to dislodge macroinvertebrates from the substrate, and then based on what you have in your, in your sample, it, it gives you a, um, a score for the site and tells you how good the overall quality is. We actually have reference stations on all the scenic rivers that we monitor three times a year, and all those reference stations are pretty much in the excellent category, so uh, we're doing, doing really well with this. Kids love it. Um, this picture is this picture is kind of old. There's there's something in it that can indicate how old. Can anybody catch it? No. See the little natural. See the natural areas uh, logo up there in the corner. 
That's when Scenic Rivers was, that's back when we were with Natural Areas. So that was probably been a good 10 years. So yeah, I think this, this, this youngster here in the front, he's probably in law school by now. But, uh, <laughs> but anyways, so maybe I need to get a, get a new picture there, but that still, still works. So in 2017, uh, we had uh, we engaged over 2,400 individuals in the program, and in turn, we estimate that engaged about 1.7 million plus macroinvertebrates. <laughs> All right, good. I got a little laugh out of that. That is, that is a joke. We have obviously no idea how many macroinvertebrates are engaged in that, in that process. But okay, good. I'll keep going with that then. We also uh, developed a new display at the Ohio State Fair our living stream display, which it was in the second year last year, and we really improved it last year. We actually had a, some custom acrylic uh, tanks made. Um, we go out, we get stream substrate, water, macroinvertebrates, put it all in there, and then let everybody that comes by reach in there and, and try to catch a crayfish or, or helga mite. And uh, it's been a big hit. Uh, we estimated uh, almost 13,000 visitors last year. And I say that's no joke because we actually had some students, I think, that stood there and counted for an hour, how many people came to the tank, and then we extrapolated that number, those numbers across the entire um, duration of the fair. So that's a little bit of science behind that estimate there, but everybody has a good time there. Everybody loves macroinvertebrates, particularly the things that can pinch you. You know, are, they're the most popular. <laughs> we also do a lot of paddling programs, events held statewide. We, we uh, initiated the Paddle Ohio program a few years ago, and that's basically a program whereby if you paddle any four different sections of a scenic rivers, water trails, or select state park lakes, then we'll send you a, a commemorative a pin for that accomplishment. And we have a different pin for each uh, level of four rivers, four, eight, 12, 16, 20. So each time you do a multiple of four rivers and submit your information, we'll, we'll send you another pin. And just for this year, we're going to give out uh, the special uh, anniversary Scenic River pins that are uh, like our logo. So there you go, a little extra incentive to get out there and paddle. And last year, we had approximately uh, over 1,200 participants. This, none of our floats are actually that exciting. <laughs> so that... That's, that's, that's an individual doing that on his own. We, we try to avoid that with the general public. These, this is one of our floats down here in the bottom. So um, yeah, nothing, nothing too risky. So feel free to come out and we'll, we'll fix you up with a boat and everything. And finally, uh, implementation of the Scenic River Law, um, something that we're mandated to do. And basically uh, what that gives us is approval, approval authority over publicly funded projects within 1,000 feet of a state-designated scenic river outside of municipal corporation limits. And you know how many times I've said that throughout the course of my career. But um, so what does that mean when you kind of stew that all down? Um, it means that any public infrastructure project within this 1,000-foot corridor needs to be reviewed and approved by the director of the department or his designee. So, um, and I mentioned earlier, private property is not regulated. So the things on the right side we have no control over uh, construction of homes, removal of the riparian corridor. A landowner can go in and cut down every tree if he wishes to do so. And we can't, we have nothing to say about that. They can build a house right next to the river. You know, there's local floodplain regulations, hopefully, that might, might address that. But we have no authority over those things. But roads, bridges, bike trails, so park trails, parks, most parks are public entities, and utilities like sewer lines and water lines. And, um, we're not in the business of saying no. What we try to do is work with uh, the entity that's you know, sponsoring the project and try to minimize the impacts associated with that project. So one thing we do, we look at the a bridge, for example, over a scenic river. This is uh, south of Darby Creek Road in uh, Pickaway County over Big Darby. And what we try to do here is uh, clear span the channel. So get the piers out of the river channel, um, that obviously reduces the impact of the stream, on the stream hydrology of the channel and um, minimizes the impact of the in-stream work. And then also increase the overall hydraulic opening of the bridge, the floodplain opening. And we're to the point now that we've been doing this for so long that entities come to us, county engineers, ODOT, and other agencies come to us and say, hey, 
we're going to build a bridge. We need to redo this bridge. And they show us the plans, and it's, they're already got a clear span design. So it's, uh, it's really become kind of a, a, a standard. So just uh, in conclusion, just a review again, um, our program is really dedicated to the conservation of the highest quality stream systems in the state of Ohio. And you know, through that, we provide other recreational opportunities and green space for communities and other benefits. So thank you very much. I think my time's up. Thank you so much, Bob. I've definitely appreciated seeing sort of the growth in the number of people that are registering their, their boats. I think seeing people do that maybe and hopefully they might be actually getting out in nature is a great thing. Well, our next speaker is Hope Taff, and we've had, a, uh, had to work hard to condense all our activities down to a, uh, into a small sort of space. Uh, I'm going to even cut down on what I have here for the sake of time, but I just wanted to sort of like share with you a little bit of background on Hope because I think it's important to appreciate sort of like the authenticity that um, she brings to all this. And I just look at what she's done, and it's, it's amazing. She's an honorary master gardener and Ohio certified volunteer naturalist. She is trained instructor for the Landscape Life Program developed by the Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife Center, the U.S. Botanical Garden and the American Society of Land, Landscape Architects. She is a former board member of the um, Alwood Audubon Center and Farm, and she is a member of the Garden Club of Dayton, and I could go on and on, but we're delighted today to have Hope Taft sharing with us her experience related to scenic rivers. We'll see how it goes. Thank you all for having me here today. I am delighted. Um, Bob and I uh, had the privilege of living in Columbus for many years, and then we moved to um, Greene County and found a wonderful home on the uh, banks of the Little Miami River, and that, of course, uh, piqued my interest in my front yard, <laughs> which changes daily from a, a, a stream to a river to a a lake to uh, uh, all sorts of uh, different uh, different ways that the river uh, displays itself. But just so that you all don't think that I got interested in rivers just because we moved there, um, Bob created this along a, uh, along the way book as he left the governorship, and it tells all of his favorite places in the state. And if you look through here, you will find that many of them have. Um, things to do with the water, and um, even on the cover, there's a picture of Bob and me canoeing. Um, in fact, we canoed on our honeymoon. Um, we turned over. I came up laughing, and we're still married. <laughs> um, so we have many, many adventures in um, canoeing and uh, loving of, of water in the river, and I'm very happy to be here with you today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Little Mammy River and uh, see if we can talk about the past, the present, and the future of the, the watershed. Fifty years ago, this month, at the end of the month, and I hope that you all will look at the um, invitation that's on your table, it talks about the celebration we're having on February the 28th at the Rotunda in the State House. If you want to come and help us participate, uh, with all the organizations on the back and with legislators, uh, please RSVP uh, because we'd love to have you. But do it soon because I have to turn in the numbers real soon. If you want something to eat, I need to know that. <laughs> um, but it was um, passed uh, so that it can protect some of the most beautiful rivers in the state, as Bob told you. Uh, when. Um, it started, many of those rivers were filled with tires and junks and cars and concrete and appliances and most everything you can imagine. Uh, aquatic and land animals that depended on the water were declining and Ohio uh, did something about it and they passed a law in February 1969 and then the feds came along and did their act in October of, six, of 1968. I'm thinking that the first line there is wrong. It should be 1968. We were first. I uh, like to uh, 
brag on Ohio any time I get. But in 1969, Ohio, the Little Miami River became the first river in Ohio to get both uh, the state designation and then a few years later get the federal designation. And those efforts to make the river qualify began almost immediately. There was a huge effort to clean the trash out, uh, and they continue today. Back then, you know, a paddle like this was the, the uh, normal piece of equipment that you had for canoes. If you wanted to race, you had a big paddle like this. Uh, nowadays, you, I should have brought my, my daughter's stand-up paddleboard um, paddle. Uh, it would be a lot different, uh, but it also wouldn't fit my car very well. Um, so it, it depends. We have come a long way in those 50 years. Um, but we still continue to um, work on trash removal. In fact, the Little Mammy River Cleaners, which I helped to start in 2010, has removed over five tons of trash and 700 tires uh, just from the Greene County section of the Little Mammy River. And Melissa Clark has been wonderful in helping us. So has the uh, Greene County uh, Parks and Trails and uh, the Bell uh, Brook Sugar Creek uh, Parks District. So you have to have a a combination of a lot of people and a lot of groups to make things happen. But the river provides us with drinking water, with recreational health and economic benefits and wildlife habitat. And so it really improves our quality of life. And every river, no matter whether it's scenic or not, provides these same benefits if it's taken care of. Um, I like to uh, quote um, uh, Glenn Thompson, who I'll talk about a little bit later, when he said that his definition of conservation was to think of conservation as treasuring of those things that give us joy and fulfillment as human beings. And I think that's a broad enough definition to include a lot of the things that you do, not only for rivers, but in other ways to preserve the land and the environment around us. What we know is the Little Miami River today started life as a north flowing tributary of the Taze River. The ancient river that flowed from North Carolina to Illinois came right through this section of Ohio. It gives a lot of us the wonderful aquifer that we utilize today for our drinking water. It, was, it changed its direction and course with the last glacier over 8,000 years ago. It is one of the few rivers to have more than one narrow passage when dammed up, <laughs> when the dammed up glacial water um, broke through and has long been the home of wildlife and people. Uh, the Hopewell built uh, Fort Ancient, and the pioneers built mills and farms, and we build houses and shopping malls along them today. Uh, I mentioned Fort Ancient uh, because another one of the things that I'm involved in <laughs> for conservation efforts is the effort of the state to list the Hopewell ceremonial cultures um, sites as world heritage sites, and hopefully by 2020, one or two, we'll have that accomplished. Don't hold your breath, though. And so what do we have to lose or to gain by uh, helping to preserve the rivers? Well, the Little Miami River was a historic river. That's one of the uh, um, markers out there you can find on the riverside. Uh, in pioneer times, there were uh, over 300 mills um, uh, for lumber or for uh, grain or for uh, wood along the river and its tributaries. Um, they all uh, disappeared when uh, people cut down the trees in the watershed and the water flow was no longer dependable, uh, but they would played a big part in our um, development um, as a, um, a state. A man who did a lot to make sure we had a scenic river law in the state was Glenn Thompson. He was the editor of the Dayton Journal Herald. Some of you all might have known him. He editor from 1959 to uh, 68. And um, he uh, really loved to um, canoe. And I think he, after a hard day at work, he would jump in his uh, canoe and go down the Little Miami River and dream about what it could be like, what it would look like if all those tires were taken out and all those cars were taken out. And he had this dream that someday a corridor of green will stretch from one end of the river to the other. And that individuals and families will enjoy peace and quiet and restoration of the spirit that comes with the clean water, birds, and trees. And it was that goal, that dream, that helped him start 
the Little Miami Inc., which is now the Little Miami Conservancy, helped start the Ohio Federation of Conservancy, which is now the Ohio Environmental Council, which helped him start the Five Rivers Metro Parks in uh, Montgomery County, which helped him do a lot to encourage all those people that uh, Bob Gable talked about passed the first uh, Scenic River Act in the country. He also went to Washington and got Ohio, uh, the Little Miami River on that list of first rivers uh, for them to consider in the federal legislation. So we owe a lot of why we're here today to his efforts. And he really wanted those corridors to stay like they should be and uh, we work hard to make that happen, to give the recreational uh, benefits, to give the wildlife benefits uh, to the area that is known as the Little Miami River. I think that's Bob and me there in our life jackets, I'm not sure. But it's pretty any time of the year. Uh, we love it and uh, we hope that you will too. I get excited every time I pass over the, the river and see these signs. Uh, because I know that a lot of work went into the effort to make the river of a high enough quality to be certified in uh, these programs. But there are still a chance for the sunset on the river and on all the scenic rivers in the state. Um, and I hope that you all will look at the river close to you and uh, get in touch with the people that are involved with it and help to make it a very special place. Uh, when we moved there in uh, uh, 2007, uh, I began to notice all of the trash that was floating down the river at various times of the year. Neighbors and I got together and said, we don't like this. And so like um, um, happened so often, um, we got together and formed the Little Miami River Cleaners. And we were very fortunate to have a lot of partners in, that wanted to help us take care of the river. And uh, since then, we have taken out tons of tires. Uh, in our, our annual spring cleanup, we have now started a fire, a fall cleanup when we focus s uh, on a two and a half mile section of the river and on tires in particular and take out tons of trash because we want it to stay a place where wildlife can thrive and that people can um, enjoy the peace and quiet of the river corridor. Uh, we eventually began to realize that there were a lot of things in the river that harmed it that we couldn't see and that we needed to do other things to uh, protect. And so we worked with the state and started the stream quality monitoring project and now we do it three times a year uh, in three different spots on the river and we have a good time um, looking at all those microinvertebrates and counting how many? 17,000 million, whatever the, that are coming. <laughs> a lot of them. Uh, but we also decided that uh, there were other threats to the river that we needed to worry about and so we started the Little Miami Watershed Network to include a wider uh, section of the river and to try to um, impact the communities and the construction and the things that were going on around it. Uh, and so we now uh, focus with other nonprofits in the area uh, to work on help advertise their efforts and we also are working on a project to put medallions on all the storm drains to alert people to put only water down the drains, rain water at that, we don't want polluted water, because you all know that anything that goes down those drains goes into a culvert, which makes a um, river, underground river that we can't see, but which is very forceful uh, because it has no way to dissipate itself, and all that polluted water goes right into our streams and our rivers. We also found that most people don't know where their watershed begins or ends. Um, and uh, what impact it has. So we've now started putting up signs, uh, any place that we can get a community to work with us to um, help people uh, know that uh, everybody lives in a watershed, all your water drains somewhere, all your pollution goes up one place or another, and that we need to think about uh, where it goes and how we can uh, impact the quality of that water uh, that goes that way. Because we really want um, our rivers to be places where the next generation will want to be and want to help um, us keep, keep them clean in the future so that the paddles won't look like this, that it won't even look like my daughter's stand-up paddleboard, but there'll be some other future creation that will get you around the river faster or in some new mode 
of transportation and um, again provide us all with the uh, spaces that will um, bring us peace and quiet and restoration of the spirit that comes with clean water, birds, and trees. And so think about it. What we uh, destroy, when we destroy something made by man, we call it vandalism. But when we destroy something made by nature, we call it progress. And that is a big difference. So think about it and what you can do in your watershed to make sure that we um, um, don't have too much progress that impacts the natural environment around us. Because when it comes to the quality of life, I suspect it's those natural environments that we all gravitate towards that, f that uh, renew our souls and make us ready for the next day as we advance towards uh, progress in the modern sense of the word. There is a green rule, um, a thumb, that says that what we do to impact nature comes back to impact us. And I th think that that's very true if you think of, of our Im impact on the environment um, around us in the climate. Uh, what we do really has come back to haunt us in many, many ways. So I hope that you will help us celebrate the 50th anniversary of the scenic, Ohio Scenic Rivers Act, the Federal Scenic Rivers Act, and um, do something in your own neighborhood, in your own community, to highlight the importance of water and to highlight the dependence of water that we all have. I read recently that people can survive a few days without food, but you can't survive nearly that long without water. So we really need to protect what we the natural resources we have. When Bob was governor, we used to say that in some day, Ohio was going to become the center of the earth because we had the, a, a large amount of water that could be used. But we need to preserve that water. We need to make sure that the aquifer is not punctured too many times because if our water gets polluted, our asset, our chief asset in the future will be lost to us all. So I thank you for having us here today. And I look forward to answering your questions with Bob uh, because I'm sure that he can answer them much better than I can. So we have time for some questions. I think Joe is going to run away with the microphone, run around with it. Just raise your hand if you have a question. My question is for Bob. Uh, the dollars that go from our license plate fees for scenic rivers, how is that money used? And if, yeah, if you can step up here because we're recording it, that'd be great. Thank you. We've used that uh, those funds for many special projects over the years. Um, we've contributed to dam removals, um, purchase of riparian forest cover. It also goes to fund the stream quality monitoring uh, program and other uh, support uh, for the for our educational efforts and the overall scenic rivers program. So um, we're not using it for staff. So it's, it's uh, being used for special projects and, and things of that nature. The license, the license plate sales have declined in recent years, and I suspect that's uh, just because there's so many different license plates now. Um, you, didn't really, you don't really create a new market, I guess, with more plates, you just kind of cut the existing market into smaller pieces. So our revenues are not what they used to be, and, but we, uh, we keep a tight, tight watch on our funds we have in there. Hi, I'm Tracy Freeman with the Nature Conservancy. And I wanted to know, you mentioned that you don't have the ability to um, regulate anything that happens on private property. So how, do you have some type of an education program, or is that up to the local um, scenic rivers chapter to educate private homeowners and landowners on the fact that they live on a scenic river and you know would they please uh, make some changes or perhaps do some things a little bit different 
because they are there? Well, we do uh, a lot of advocacy work at the local level. Our regional managers are always talking to local community leaders, uh, township trustees, um, community leaders in, in municipalities, and advocating for the conservation of the floodplain and riparian areas and through through local you know laws, if possible, zoning and things of that nature can be passed. It typically doesn't apply to agricultural land, but you know when land uh, is developed and is changed from urban to ag, then you can have you can actually have uh, protective buffers and things put in place in the zoning code to help minimize the impacts of the urbanization. Um, we also rely a lot on local partners. Our Scenic River Advisory Council members, each uh, Scenic River has a, an advisory council of uh, 10 uh, members, not more than 10 members, to make from local interests. Some of them are, are from local governments. And, you know, we also rely on them to do some advocacy work at the local level. And our partners, like um, the group that the HOPE started, the Little Miami Watershed Network, um, they've been working on advocacy efforts in, in Beaver Creek and some of the communities along the Little Miami River, you know, to help promote the conservation of riparian areas and minimize stormwater runoff and you know implement uh, green stormwater treatment features things of that nature so so we rely a lot on other organizations local partners and and just you know try to advocate and educate as best we can but we love the nature conservancy and health yes. hello over here um, I'm Molly Simonis, so I'm a recent graduate of Ohio State. I got my PhD here in environmental science, but I also uh, did my undergraduate at Ohio University in Southeast Ohio. So one of the things I'm curious about is it looks like there weren't any scenic rivers really in Southeast Ohio. Is that a lack of local interest or is that a water quality issue down there? That's really a, that's a it's really a lack of local interest. There are some streams that um, in that southeast Ohio region that would meet the criteria. I've seen a few of them, um, but we've never we've just never had an organized group at a local level come forward and say, "Hey, we'd like to designate this stream." It's always been a goal of mine. I always, as a program manager, I always said before I retire, I want to get the stream designated in southeast Ohio. So. Quite frankly, I'm running out of time, so I'm starting to get old. But <laughs> so I don't know if you if you have some connections in Southeast Ohio, and you know there's some there's certainly some streams that would meet your criteria. We just need um, a local organized group to step up and say, hey, let's get this river designated. Uh, I'm Don Hollister. I'm a township trustee on the Little Miami, uh, and hope you said something that jolted me. Uh, you said that as trees were cut down, the feasibility of mills was reduced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me more. Well, I'm not a scientist, but the way I understand it is when you cut down the trees, you change the hydrology of the water, you change the soil, the soil composition and its ability to hold water. That's why you want those riparian ways along the river is so that they can hold back the pollutants and not let them get into the stream so fast. But if you cut down the trees, um, then the water gets into the rivers faster, but it also dries up faster. And so the, the, uh, the flow of the river became unsustainable. Uh, when the trees are there, it was a nice natural flow all the time and the mills could run. Uh, when the trees were cut, it would ebb and flow. Uh, they found that the only time they could run the mills was after a heavy rain, i.e. flood stage. And so um, they couldn't depend on that sporadic time um, to run the mills productively. And so they eventually quit. Does that kind of meet the um, <laughs> the level <laughs> of uh, in, in scientific study that you all might want <laughs> in layman's terms. <laughs> Hello, I come here and I say I'm not going to say anything, but I happen to have a lot of knowledge of the history of this. And uh, when our first speaker said that this preceded the Clean Water Act of 1972, I had to sort of squeam in my 
seat because I know from my dissertation and teaching this field from 65 on for about 10 years that in 1965, with the great interest in our clean water, the federal government required interstate water quality standards. The next year in 66, they required it on intrastate within a given state if the state had grants and loans to build wastewater treatment plants. And in the, about this time this was going on, many environmental groups looked at the Corps of Engineers. And in 1898, the Corps of Engineers was supposed to have a permit program on industrial waste. It wasn't influenced. These court cases resulted in a Corps of Engineers permit system that was incorporated into the 72 law. The 72 law brought all of these things together. And I know the history of this, and it sort of irritates me when we say, well, our Clean Water Act of 1972 began all of this. It didn't. And I know that there, the interest in the clean water through all of these water quality standards laws and grants and loans from municipal treatment plants and the incorporating the Corps of Engineers getting them going on this permit system that was incorporated into our point source permit system in 72. It, without that, these things tied together. And I, I, I just wish that we knew the history of this, which some of you heard me talk about this in class. And I, I still think that understanding Ohio's surface water quality standards should be resurrected and published because we don't understand this. I'm sorry, I come here, I say I'm not gonna say anything, but I do. You make a good point. You know, most things are passed by legislatures uh, after many, many years of small incremental steps. And it, it, they may seem, they're big at the time that they're happening, but it is a, a gradual process that gets to be um, a major piece of legislation. And uh, I think that, and I have no proof of this, but I think that one of the things that spurred the um, Scenic River Act was the um, 1950s uh, plan from the Corps of Engineers to dam a lot of the rivers in the country. And there were uh, two or three um, or four dams that were proposed for the Little Miami River. And I think that that was one of the things that really galvanized Glenn Thompson to um, think that something needed to be done. And so it's all these things that build on top of each other that make, uh, make a difference and make big things happen. And we appreciate um, you bringing those, uh, those steps uh, to our attention because it all works together. It's like um, community coalitions. Uh, one part can do one thing and another part can do another, but if you don't work together, if you don't build on, on those, those efforts of everybody, uh, you don't make the big impact that uh, we need to have made. Hello, Hope. Um, my name is Alexa. I'm a student at Ohio State. Um, with, the, with your establishment of the Little Miami River Cleaners and the um, not working program. Have you noticed the creation or interest in other areas of Ohio to create such programs? I'm sort of singularly focused. <laughs> uh, maybe Bob can tell you. I know, and he can talk about it better than I can, but I think there are two rivers in the state that are very close to being um, um, nominated or whatever you want to call it, designated as scenic rivers, and he can tell you more about that. But, you know, it's any group um, that wants to band together, if you go and talk to your uh, township trustees or your people in that live close to the river, they'll probably be right there waiting for that flagpole to rally around. And that's what you really need to do. You need to stand up and be that flagpole so that others can rally around you to make a difference. There's, uh, there's many groups across the state that focus on different watersheds and different rivers, just as Hope's organization uh, works on Little Miami. So there's the Little Miami uh, Conservancy, which used to be Little Miami Incorporated. The Nature Conservancy does a lot of work on the Darby Creeks, the Grand River. Uh, we have Grand River Watershed Partners uh, Chagrin River watershed partners that focus on issues in the Chagrin River. So uh, Darby Creek Association. So there's many local grassroots organizations that work on these 
rivers at the local level. So we have a, a good uh, high degree of support across the state on many of these river systems from these local organizations. They do a lot of work. They do a lot of work that we can't do. A lot of the advocacy at the local level and, you know, promoting the uh, good land use practices and things that we really can't, can't get in at this point in time. Um, Hope reminded me that we were working on the designation of two other rivers right now, Pima Tuning Creek in uh, Northeast Ohio. Matthew Smith is working with a coalition of local partners to uh, complete the designation study on that stream. Uh, it's very, very nice, very high quality stream. Some of the sections may meet the water criteria, so we're, we're looking for that study here soon. And then we have an organized uh, group on the Paint Creek in um, Ross, Fayette counties, Highland County, uh, building support for the designation of that. And they're actually looking for funding now to complete the designation study. What we've done in recent years, DNR used to do these designation studies, and quite frankly, it would take forever. Um, so we now have uh, local coalitions of partners that work on the designation studies, contribute different elements of the uh, designation study, or in some cases raise funds to pay a university to complete the designation study. So that was what was done with the Mad River, although the Mad River didn't get designated, it was actually completed by uh, the staff at Wittenberg University, the designation study. And so the local organizations raised money uh, to pay the university to do the study. It was done, with, done in six months, so it's a lot more efficient than us trying to do it on our own. So 50th anniversary is a great opportunity to look back and celebrate the past. I'm curious if you want to reflect on um, what some of the opportunities are for the future or like what the big issues are for the future. Because we've got a lot of young students here. This is going to be the next 50 years. are going to be their generation to sort of like carry them back and forward. What's the, uh, what, are, what are the challenges or the big picture things that we need to be thinking about the next 50 years? Okay. <laughs> well, you, you, can, you can contribute to that as well. Um, I think the biggest biggest challenge for the next 50 years in many of these river corridors is going to be changing land use from rural to urban. Um, Ohio continues to grow and, and, organize, and urbanize and, and develop over time. Um, you know, like I mentioned in my presentation, a lot of the scenic river watersheds are still rural, agricultural land use. And that agricultural land use with, you know, a, a riparian forest buffer left intact along the stream contributes to the conservation of these systems. Sure, there's, there's impacts from agricultural land use, but those impacts are not as, they don't hit a system as, as quickly and as hard as, as uncontrolled urbanization. So that's gonna be our biggest challenge in the future is, is to, you know, how do we mitigate the changing land use and the urbanization of the lands, landscape and still protect the high quality stream systems? That's a, that's a still a bit of an unknown. We can, you know, we look at systems like the Chagrin, which is in predominantly an urban area of Ohio. The Little Miami sections of it is becoming very urbanized. It's still, main, those streams are still maintaining excellent water quality and high biological diversity. Um, you know, is it, is it because we have so much protected buffer along those streams? Um, is it because there's land, <coughs> open land in the urban landscape, large lot subdivisions or estate type subdivisions with, all, with you know, less imperviousness? We don't know, but that's going to be the greatest challenge is how to mitigate that in the future in some of these stream corridors. So that brings me up to my um, uh, desire to uh, encourage everybody to find the sweet spot where um, um, the in environmental issues, the social issues and the economic issues all can come together and find that area in the center where we can all agree and work for the best of, of all three entities, which is the main philosophy of the SITES program, S-I-T-E-S, -E which has now become part of the LEADS program for development. Um, and if you all are not familiar with that, I urge you to get familiar with that. I urge you to get familiar with the state plan of um, land use that was developed around Lake Erie and then now has become a, nat a statewide um, effort uh, because there again it helps to um, get people to think about what they're doing uh, to the land and thus to their future. Time for one more question. Uh, 
I volunteer with the Scenic Rivers with the stream quality monitoring, and I'd like to point out my own feature of uh, why some of the education aspects might be found with what your point is on how to have a relationship versus uh, eco-based uh, from where the legislation might help out. I know that we, from the past and low flow years, have had certain kind of sweet spots with our boating. And in Northeast Ohio, I've come across some of the landowners and saying, we're on a lean year. We're on a lean year, okay. So um, since we find the sweet spots in industry and travel and tourism, could you please tell me if there's a recreation designation that works with any of the research on um, good, uh, best managed practices to uh, have a wetland preservation stamp or another kind of graphical interpretation so people who are wanting to get involved in volunteering during lean years can talk to industries and, and develop relationship marketing in terms of how we can begin lo like a loan program or however we, we can develop stream quality on a level which increases the amount of education. Uh, I think if I under understand your question, what you're saying, it, um, again, I think that probably comes back to our many of our local partners to work on education and advocacy work for conservation of uh, sensitive habitats, wetland areas, riparian forest buffers, and you know that will contribute to. You, you mentioned uh, low flow years or, or lean years. And that will contribute, those, the conservation of those areas will contribute to a better overall stream hydrology. Um, you know, there's a lot of, in many streams, there's a, a lot of interrelation between groundwater, stream flow, adjacent wetlands, water's moving back and forth from, from the aquifer to the stream and, and so on. So, you know, conservation of these areas that are important to the, the aquifer will help uh, protect stream flow and, and maintain a better low flow rather than have uh, you know these these systems where if, you know again if it uh, watershed urbanizes and becomes all impervious uh, you you don't have any infiltration when it rains everything runs off so you get a big flow big high peak in the in the receiving stream and then it goes down and because no water soaked into the aquifer you know the stream goes down and it's it's dry and it doesn't have the recharge necessarily that it once did so um, again you know advocating and working on the conservation of these these areas at the local level I think is the the best way to address that and and get uh, people thinking about that great well that brings us to a close I want to thank uh, Hope and Bob for a wonderful presentation uh, I want to appreciate all of you who uh, have turned out today um, I love living in central Ohio and I love the old Tangy River and I love what we've done with our own river here so uh, um, to honor the, uh, um, the rivers, I think, is a wonderful opportunity this year, and I appreciate uh, your taking the time out of your days to, to join us here. As is our tradition at the Environmental Professionals Network, uh, we have a certificate of appreciation that we'd like to offer both of you. Uh, uh, and appropriately, it is an image of the Olentangy River, actually pre-taking pre out of the dams, but it's a, a wonderful image that we'd like to, to share Thank with you. both Thank of you. you very much. I'm sure there'll be more opportunities to celebrate uh, um, throughout the year for the uh, Scenic River programs. Uh, in terms of the future of the EPN, I want to sort of share with you that we will be continuing to talk about water topics at the next uh, uh, EPN on March 6th. The Water Management Association of Ohio will be partnering with to uh, talk about flooding, a national, state, and local issue. Uh, and I also want to bring your attention, mark on your calendars, Monday, April 16th, the evening, we will have our signature EPN event. We're excited to bring to you a panel of sustainability experts from Patagonia, uh, Owens Corning, and uh, Jenny's Ice Cream, uh, talking about um, sustainability issues in the, in the supply chain. So we're very excited about the upcoming programs. We appreciate you joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.